Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to be looking at Zero Dark Thirty. Released in 2012, Zero Dark Thirty was directed by Catherine Bigelow, and it tells the story of the 10-year search for Osama bin Laden between the attack on September 11th and when the Navy SEAL Team 6 killed bin Laden in May of 2011. To help us separate fact from fiction in the movie, I'll be joined by Peter Bergen, the author of what many to be the definitive biography of bin Laden, the book called The Rise and Fall of Osama bin Laden. Now, if you're catching this on the day it's released, August 3rd, Peter's book is being released on paperback. So make sure to check out the show notes for a link to grab your own copy. Before we chat with Peter, it's time to set up our game. Two truths and a lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true. And that means one of them is an all out lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, one of the American helicopters really did crash during the raid on bin Laden's compound. Number two, the U.S. found bin Laden's compound through his courier. Number three, the U.S. government knew with absolute certainty that bin Laden was inside the compound when President Obama ordered the raid. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode. And then, of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to connect with Peter Bergen about the historical accuracy of Zero Dark Thirty. Let's start with a high-level overview of the movie. If you were to give it a letter grade for historical accuracy, what would it get? Well, you know, I think the the makers of the film, uh, because they they said it was you know based on uh, real events, they opened themselves up to criticism, uh, legitimate criticism yeah. that a lot of what they portrayed wasn't really accurate. Um, and they hid behind, you know, when they got those criticisms, they hid behind, well, it was only just a film. It wasn't a documentary yet at the same time, they were claiming that it was sort of strongly based on real history. And, um, I think that, you know, uh, it's a, it's a good film. That doesn't mean that it's good history. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but. Didn't the filmmakers during some of the marketing of the movie kind of put forth that it was more of a journalistic approach and that kind of added them to even more scrutiny? Yeah. And I mean, you know, in their defense, they did talk to people involved in the hunt, particularly the character that is sort of a composite, but it's called Maya in the film. Um, and they also talked to people at the CIA and the CIA was somewhat cooperative Obviously, the CIA was putting out their mm. kind of the version of the story that they wanted to put out, but it's not a work of history. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't think people will be watching it uh, now to say, well, what really happened with the hunt? I mean, it's just it, it, it would be kind of a waste yeah. of time to be honest. Now, which isn't to say, you know, it, 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 right. it's it's a good film, but you know, they, I think they um, kind of overregged the pudding, to use a British expression, when they. They talked about all the journalism behind it. It was, you know, it, you know, we can get into the specifics, but there were a lot of things that weren't really uh, kosher from a factual point of view. One thing that the movie never really mentions is how the U.S. knew that bin Laden was behind the 9-11 attacks. Uh, we know from history there was the letter to America that bin Laden wrote claiming responsibility for the attack, but the movie never really explains that. Did the U.S. just take bin Laden for his word, or was there more investigation to verify that bin Laden was behind the attacks? Yeah, I mean, this was the largest criminal investigation in history. They, uh, they, uh, I think they went up, they went after 500,000 leads. Wow. They interviewed tens of thousands of people. Um, I mean, this it's not just bin laden who took credit for it all each of the 19 hijackers all filmed uh sort of so-called martyrdom videos which were released over time and 
you know, initially Bin Laden denied his involvement because it was problematic. At the time he's being protected by the Taliban. And if he said, yeah, I was behind it, it would be hard for the Taliban to say, well, we're not going to give him up. So, I mean, the, the evidence that Bin Laden was involved in 9-11 is overwhelming. There's, um, the 9-11 commission report is easily available. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> if anybody has any lingering doubts, they can just refer to that. One of my questions, I guess, would be, why would he want to claim responsibility? Wouldn't it be easier to carry out more attacks if no one knew who he was? But maybe initially he didn't. But once people realized it was him, it was just kind of a moot point. Well, it became moot at a certain point. The Taliban had fallen. He was on the run. He, you know, this was his, in his own mind, his greatest achievement. So he had no problem okay. taking credit for it, for it particularly you know, years after 9-11 when he was in hiding. And there was, you know, it... it it no longer, no longer made sense for him to maintain some kind of implausible mm -hmm. deniability. Okay, that makes sense. Something that we do see throughout the movie is more terrorist attacks than just 9-11. For example, we see there's a shooting in Saudi Arabia, a double-decker bus that gets bombed in London. Were these events that actually happened, and did bin Laden claim responsibility for them? Yeah, I, I, the, the shooting in Saudi Arabia, I, I, there was Al-Qaeda launched a number of attacks inside Saudi Arabia, sort of starting in 2003 um, and okay. those were Al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia so they were certainly ultimately Bin Laden's responsibility the attack in London in 2005 killed 52 commuters on the London transportation sy system on buses and subway um, the, the London underground and Al-Qaeda was deeply involved in that uh, so you know the, f the fact that the movie referenced those is completely you know reasonable because Al-Qaeda you know, continue to try and attack the West and other, you know, and, and also targets like the Saudis that Al-Qaeda has been opposed to since the beginning uh, of the, the group was founded. One of the plot points that we see in the movie gave me the impression that Bin Laden knew, obviously, people were looking for him, but really who in the U.S. government was looking for him? Uh, I give some examples from the movie. Uh, it would, and I think it was September 20th, 2008 is what the movie mentions. There's an attack at the Marriott hotel in Pakistan, uh, nearly kills Jessica and Maya, two characters, the two CIA agents in the movie, they're looking for bin Laden. Then later the, Jessica has put together a meeting with a Jordanian doctor who claims to be bin Laden's inner circle. And Jessica is killed by the bomber who turned out to be be not actually a doctor and the movie mentioned it being an American base camp yeah. Chapman in Afghanistan. And then even later in the movie, there's an attempt on Maya's life while she's in Pakistan. Did bin Laden know about the search for him? Uh, I mean, he, he knew people were looking for him in a general sense. He had a pretty healthy, um, kind of respect for the capabilities of us intelligence. Uh, he, uh, for instance, um, you know, when he when he was living in Abbottabad, Pakistan, he'd wear a cowboy hat when he took his very short walks in the garden so that American satellites, and mm -hmm. American satellite image, you know, couldn't couldn't see him. Um, in fact, nobody could see him when he was taking his walks uh, was his intention. So, you know, I um, and then, yeah, the movie, yeah, was the fact Jessica is based on a real CIA uh, operative who was one of the first uh to be attached to the bin Laden unit, I had been looking for bin Laden since 1996. She was assassinated uh, by a, an Al Qaeda triple agent who posed as somebody that could help the CIA find bin Laden. But in fact, he was working for Al Qaeda and he killed her and six other CIA contractors and um, officials at, at Camp Chapman in Afghanistan in a suicide attack. Uh, he was coming to a meeting with them and he uh he was he was using he used that as an opportunity to kill them so the movie you know th that's part of the issue of course it's a film so that is completely true the you know w whether or not you know maya the maya character and the jessica character narrowly escaped then um you know a suicide bombing at in islamabad at a particular hotel i have no idea there was a suicide bombing at that hotel were they there? I, I don't know. And that's kind of part of the problem is that some of the things the movie asserts as facts, uh, or, you know, it's just hard to like okay. disentangle kind of what's true and what isn't true. And it's a movie. I mean, so, uh, you know, it, it, you, it, of course you're going to take artistic license, but that said, 
you know, they tied it so much to like what really happened that, um, I think it then you, you completely legitimately, people are going to have, can, can kind of critique what they, what they say. Uh, and some of the things they said are just like, uh, I did, you know, there's no factual record to dispute or to, um, assert what they assert. For instance, this scene we just discussed, which is Maya and Jessica. Now Maya, anyways, she's a composite character. She's based on a particular CIA, um, okay. Officer who was you know, instrumental in the hunt for Bin Laden, but she has elements of some other other CIA female officers who who were involved to the extent that you can decipher all this because again it's 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 a composite. There's a scene in the movie after a bombing in New York City where the CIA station chief right. Joseph Bradley tells Maya that he doesn't care about bin Laden anymore. The mission is to protect the homeland. It seems like the focus is kind of shifting. It's changing. Bradley goes on to say that no one has talked to bin Laden in four years. He's probably dead. Maya basically has to threaten Bradley with a congressional hearing about subverting the effort to capture or kill bin Laden. And that's when he lets her continue her quest. Were there ever actually points like this where people within U.S. intelligence just assumed bin Laden might already be dead or just not a priority target anymore? Yeah, I think that was the weaker. I mean, there was certainly a school of thought uh, at the CIA amongst some people that, you know, they actually they changed the name of the bin Laden unit in 2005. Um, uh, they, they, it, they, it kind of like, it became instead of a sort of single a unit that was looking for bin Laden, it sort of, it, it's, it, it took on a, a bigger mission because there was certainly a view of the CIA, uh, that, um, you know, it was more bigger than just one man. It wasn't just about bin Laden, you know, this thing had sort of, you know, the war in Iraq had happened. Al Qaeda in Iraq was now a pretty strong force. There were other, um, affiliates of Al Qaeda. And so that, that's true. But the idea that one of the kind of, I think, strange things in the film mm -hmm. is the idea that only Maya, the character played by Jessica Chastain, was really trying to find Bin Laden, which was complete nonsense. I mean, there was, there were, uh, yeah, it was a relatively small group of people at, uh, at the CIA, still classified number, who, you know, were looking for Bin Laden every day. Uh, but there was a very strong, uh, and people stayed in that unit long part, you know, some of them stayed, if they didn't get, want to get promoted into some other position because they were so, you know, keen to get him. And so the idea that she was the only person sort of trying to find Bin Laden is one of the, I think, an absolutely fanciful part of the film. Yeah, that, that really stood out to me too, because it just seemed like she was really the driver behind it and she had to fight almost. Was there any point where Bin Laden maybe wasn't as high of a priority or was it just that they just kind of changed their scope and then grew? No, I mean, it, it was always a priority. I mean, the guy, you know, Bin Laden was the, could kill nearly 3,000 Americans in one morning in Washington, New York and Pennsylvania. It was, believe me, it was a high priority. Uh, and the, but the problem was that is the cold, the trail had gone very cold. But, did, you know, particularly by 2004, 2005, I think the CIA realized that there was going to be no detainee who would just either, you know, would know where Bin Laden was. And even if he knew, he wasn't going to say. And in fact, no one really did know, including the people that they had in custody. They, they, they might have information that ultimately would be helpful, but they didn't have any kind of like, you know, here's the Rosetta Stone to find Bin Laden. They, you know, Bin Laden was hiding from people in his own organization. They didn't know where he was. He was practicing very careful operational security. So, um, you know, and the, the film opened, I think one of the most leading, misleading things about the film, and I watched an early sort of, not an early, a, a, a close to final cut with, 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 uh, uh, a group of others. Um, and, you know, it was this sort of very long torture sequence at the beginning, which the film strongly implies led to Bin Laden. And, you know, in fact, the story of the hunt for Bin Laden was really an Agatha Christie story, not a. We're going to torture this guy so that he gives up this one piece of information that will basically, you know, because the film has to be very linear and it, you've only got two and a half hours. And, you know, so in fact, it was a very complicated story that even in, in a book, you, you and I've written a book about this, 
um, called Manhunt. And I sort of, you know, I've learned more about it in a recent book I just published called The Rise and Fall of Osama Bin Laden. We're still finding out things about the hunt, about what Bin Laden was doing. We're still finding out things 10 years later um, because it was only in 2017 that all the documents that were recovered by the U.S. Navy SEALs in Abbottabad, Pakistan, were completely released, and a lot of them are in Arabic. And there are, you know, meant there's like 470,000 files or 6,000 pages of useful material. So, you know, I'm just, all by way of saying that certainly some of the detainees that, that had a useful information about bin Laden were taught, were coercively interrogated by the CIA. Most of those people gave up misleading information about bin Laden. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> But so, but the, the film, by implication, makes an argument that torture was very helpful to finding Bin Laden, which is, of course, what the CIA, <laughs> that's a message the CIA was very much trying to get, a, get across, mm -hmm. and that they, of course, cooperated with the filmmakers. And I don't think the filmmakers necessarily completely understood that they were essentially uh, putting out a message that really benefited the CIA. And in fact, when the film came out, uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, who led the Senate Foreign Intelligence Committee and did a huge investigation of this question, 600 pages of which were published unclassified, six thousand, there's thousands of pages that have not been published. You know, th their conclusion was very clear, and they, you know, they spent, they, yeah, they looked at a great deal of information uh, that torture, you know, didn't lead to Bin Laden. There were a whole set of other things uh, that that were helpful. And, you know, they, they range from detainee interviews, some of which were not, uh, you know, which were just conducted by standard interrogations, uh, third party intelligence services, giving information, satellite intelligence, uh, the, um, you know, um, intercepts, et cetera. I mean, it was really a mosaic of things that created this circumstantial case that Bin Laden was living in a And it was always a circumstantial case. It was never like a definitive piece of proof. And at the end of the day, President Obama, who doesn't really appear in the film at all, in fact, interestingly, I mean, that maybe, you know, that, that, the whole, the whole decision making around was he there or not isn't really treated as much in the film. And when I wrote the book about it, I mean, I realized there were several buckets. Uh, you know, there was the CIA story, which was really this Agatha Christie story, detective story. There was the, um, the story of the political decision making in the White House. After all, President Obama had to make a decision: should we do a raid? Will it be a small drone strike? Will it be, um, you know, some operate joint operations with the Pakistanis? Will it be? There were a menu of op will it be a B fifty two bombing raid? There were a menu of options from which he had, he could select. In the end, he went with the raid, which was, of course, had some risk, but you know, the, you could definitely prove that Bin Laden was there. You could pick up all the intelligence that they picked up after the raid, if he really was there. And so that, you know, again, the film is two and a half hours or whatever the length it is. And so it can't tell everything, but you know, the raid, the, you know, it, it required, it was almost a year of decision-making from August of 2010 to May of 2011 for Obama, you know, to get the first intelligence that Bin Laden may be there and then to go through all the different like, can we get more intelligence? What are our, what are our military op options? And then to approve the raid that actually happened. Um, and then, of course, the, the other big bucket is the raid and what happened that night. Um, and and, yeah, and another, another big bucket, which the film can't, doesn't really get into detail, is what was Bin Laden doing during this time? Uh, um, he was living in a bad He wasn't, yeah, you know, he was trying to manage a global terrorist enterprise, but he was doing it through couriers and met handwritten messages, which is very, you know, not the most efficient way to do it. But he certainly was trying to micromanage his organization. Um, and, and, you know, he wasn't just sort of passively just sitting there, which of course is why he was eventually found because if he hadn't communicated with anybody, there wouldn't have been the trail of breadcrumbs that led to him eventually. You know, I wanted to ask you about that because the movie does show some of that kind of uh, Maya's character. She finds a courier. I think I actually mentioned in the very early in the you're talking about the interrogation, um, yep. the courier named Abu Ahmed. And then towards the end of the movie, they find out that his real name is Ibrahim Saeed. They geolocate him using his phone, follow his white SUV to a large compound where they think he must be living. And that compound becomes something of interest because it has like 16 foot 
walls topped with barbed wire, blacked out windows, a privacy fence, even on the higher level balcony. Uh, but even despite this, nothing really seems to happen for a long time. And the movie, it seems to frustrate Maya because she eventually grows to believe that Bin Laden himself is there and nothing's really happening. But it sounds like there was a lot more decision-making going on in the background. Was that how they found and identified Bin Laden's home? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's basically right. At some point, there was an, in, an intercept of this guy, Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, the father of Ahmed from Kuwait, which was a sort of nom de guerre. And he, uh, he was talking to somebody in Al-Qaeda. They intercepted his phone uh, call to someone in the Gulf. The content of the call indicated that he was still in Al-Qaeda, which was an open question of the CIA. They found him in Peshawar. Um, some of the, you know, like we still don't, I don't think we completely understand all the different things that happened here because some of it's sort of like still highly classified, but they, they were able to find him and see that he was making this call in Peshawar. Now Peshawar is a city of millions of people. So it's not like, you know, that was it. Um, and then I think, you know, a, a third, a, 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 another intelligence agency, which I've got to presume is the Pakistanis said that his real name was Ibrahim Saeed, which was correct. Uh, and eventually, somehow, they you know, were able to find his uh, very distinctive white Suzuki Jeep, uh, which had a rhinoceros wheel on the back in Peshawar, and track him back to the city of Abbottabad, which is a pretty obscure provincial city in Pakistan. Two of his compound, which you mentioned, had the high walls. The people there weren't using the internet. They were burning, they were burning their trash. And uh, the CIA started observing it. And, you know, one of the reasons things moved slowly, well, this was August of 2010. I mean, um, there was no, the, yeah, they could never, you know, they, they could never determine as a, as a factual matter that Bin Laden really was there. It was circumstantial. So they realized that there were two families living on the compound, the body, two bodyguards of Bin Laden. And then they realized it was a third family. And this third family seemed to be pretty sizable. There were three female, three adult females, uh, you know, and a number of children and grandchildren. That was Bin Laden's kids and grandkids, um, and his three wives. Uh, and they did that by counting laundry, uh, you know, on the laundry line. Yeah, this all is take time. Um, and again, you know, the, 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 there were some people like the Maya character, based on a real person, who had been following Bin Laden for some period of time. And they were pretty convinced that this was Bin Laden. There was also other people of the agency who had gone lived through the Iraqi weapons of mass destruction debacle. And, you know, they were like very leery of a circumstantial case because at one point, Bin Laden, uh, Obama asked, you know, why is it that some people are at 80%, you know, of certainty that Bin Laden's there? And why are some at 40%? And Mike Morrell, who was the number two uh, CIA director, said, look, I mean, you know, there was for people like myself who live with the weapons of mass destruction debacle of the agency, it's like, you know, there was more circumstantial evidence that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction than, than you know, than Bin Laden living in Abbottabad, which would be, that's a pretty sobering comment. And so, you know, it really became a political question. It, you know, at a certain point, it was an intelligence question. Bin Laden was either 100% there or he was not there. You know, it's like these percentages sort of give were actually kind of misleading because he either was really there or really wasn't. And so it's no longer an intelligence question, it's a political question and a, about what am I going to do about it? And, you know, Obama made the right choice, but it's easy to see that he made the right choice when you know how it turned out. But if it hadn't gone well, you know, but all the people in the room were that final meeting on April 28th, 2011, when they met to discuss what to do. And Obama went around the room, said, you know, what should we do? Biden, Biden was opposed because he thought there were too many risks blowing up the relationship with the Pakistanis, uh, having some kind of firefight with the Pakistanis. Robert Gates, the defense secretary, was opposed. You know, Gates had been working for every president since Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Biden had become a senator when B Obama was like 12. And, you know, so those, and then other people, Hillary Clinton kind of gave a sort of long response about the negatives and positives and came down saying you should do it. Other people around the room said you should do it. So, you know, that, it, it kind of moves away from like, what's the intelligence to, okay, what do we do about it? And that really becomes a political question and a, and a military question. Um, and, um, but so, you know, 
that the intelligence first began developing in a real way in August of 2010. Uh, Obama authorizes the raid on the morning of uh, April 29th, 2001, uh, 2011. The next day, there's cloud in, uh, cloudy weather in Abbottabad. Admiral McCraven, who's the overall commander of Joint Special Operations Command, delays the operation because of the clouds. It's like, why, why take an extra risk? Um, and then, of course, on May 1st, 2011, the two Black Hawk helicopters, who are stealth Black Hawk helicopters, take off from eastern Afghanistan. They're accompanied um, also shortly thereafter by large Chinooks, uh, which are in, contain the quick reaction force. And uh, by, you know, Pakistan is nine hours ahead. And so this, this, begin, this process, you know, people start gathering at the White House, uh, the, you know, shortly after lunchtime, uh, it's beginning to, they take off at 1030 at night from eastern Afghanistan, and they arrive in about about essentially midnight uh, local time, which is 3 p.m. in the afternoon White House time. Okay, so so was there? Um, I, th- I think the movie mentioned um, when the SEAL Team Six was training Chris Pratt's character Justin, one of the SEALs, he mentioned something to Maya about how there was an op in two thousand seven where they thought they found Bin Laden, but he wasn't there, and they lost a few guys. So was the movie correct to suggest that there were other times where intelligence thought perhaps they had found Bin Laden? I mean, there were a ton of there were a ton of. Um, yeah, you know, kind of sightings of Bin Laden, almost none of which panned out, all of which had to be kind of run down. Bin Laden was in Brazil, or he was, you know, it was just most of them were nothing. Uh, there were, I, you know, there was, there were, there certainly were some Joint Special Operations Command operations going after uh, what they thought might be Bin Laden or, or even Al Zawari. Not, and, you know, may, maybe one or two. Uh, on the Afghan Pakistan border. Uh, of course, you know, that those didn't pan out either. So, um, yeah, this was really, it's not like there was some other operation that nearly got bin Laden. That didn't happen. Okay. Okay. Cause that was the impression that I got was because it was somebody from team six, then they must've gone in. And so they must've, they must've sent seals in before for another operation where they thought it was bin Laden. It wasn't him. It sounds like it wasn't the case. Well, they, they may have sent him, but okay. there was no evidence that any operation ever was ever near Bin Laden. The last time okay. U.S. soldiers had him surrounded, more or less, was December 12, 2001 at the Battle of Tara Bora, but he escaped. Well, you mentioned this, and um, in the movie, we do see the operation itself on May 1st, 2011. Maya is at the forward operating base in Afghanistan. And she finds out the operation to take up Bin Laden is a go. So we see two Black uh, Black Hawk stealth helicopters take off and disappear into the night. And right away, the mission doesn't really go according to the plan, at least in the movie. One of the helicopters crashes. Uh, Fortunately, nobody on the SEAL team is hurt, though. So the other helicopter lands, and they continue the mission. Before they breach the house, someone fires a gun through the door. Uh, team six returns fire. They call for Ibrahim to come out. A woman comes out instead. And then once they get inside, they find Ibrahim is dead. Apparently they had hit, hit him and they have turned fire through the door. The seals continue going through the house. Next, they call for someone named Abrar, which the movie doesn't really talk too much about him. Uh, uh Man with a gun appears, they shoot him, and there's women screaming over his body as well. What was interesting to me at this point was there's enough noise being created that the residents around the compound are starting to investigate. Team six members use loudspeakers to tell people to stay back or they're going to open fire. And then inside we see team six members moving upstairs. They call Usama and... We don't really see him in the movie, but there's like this dark figure. It's dark out. They shoot, uh, hear a body thud. Women are screaming and a couple more shots to make sure that the man is dead. And then on the other side, we hear the radio, over the radio, Geronimo, Forgotten Country, Geronimo. And then they take Bin Laden's uh, body in a bag. How well did the movie do showing the operation itself? Well, you know, what you just recited is basically what happened. I mean, that, okay. that, there's not, nothing there that is inaccurate. 
Um, and that's a very good summary of like what happened that night. Okay. So it seems like the movie got it pretty accurate, the operation itself. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, it's just with that, that, that's pretty much exactly as it went down. I, I also um, was the only outside observer to get on the compound before the Pakistanis demolished it um, in 2012. I didn't, I didn't know they were going to demolish it two weeks later, but uh, that enabled me to kind of get a better sense of kind of what happened that night um, and also how Bin Laden and his three wives and two dozen kids mm-hmm. and grandkids were living on the compound. And, uh, you know, I think the movie, which I haven't seen for a while, but your description of it kind of accords pretty, you know, pretty closely with, with what happened that night. And, you know, it was also, I had the benefit of literally being able to retrace the steps of what the SEALs did that evening where you, you could see that night, I saw where the helicopter crashed. You can still see burn marks on the wall where, where it, where it crashed. Uh, I saw the intense firefight that you described with. Uh, first of all, uh, Ibrahim, uh, and then, uh, and then, um, a bra and then the sun colored on the second floor. And then finally, a a Sam bin Laden on the top third floor. Uh, so, you know, it, that, 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 that's pretty much, you know, still a movie, but that's a, a good summary of what happened. Do we know if they knew that they were coming? Um, yeah. I mean... In the movie, it seems like they're still pretty quiet, even though once things, once they start kind of raiding the compound. Yeah, I mean, we now know that, well, A, you know, a, um, American Black Hawk helicopter goes down in your compound. <laughs> it's going to make some noise, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's going to, that's going to, that's going to make a lot of noise. But even before then, you know, helicopters don't fly at night in, in, our, in around Abbottabad. And Bin Laden, we now know from a, a fairly detailed Pakistani investigation of what happened heard the sound uh, you know the sound of these helicopters yeah they were stealth helicopters but by the time they're two minutes out they're still making a lot of noise relatively speaking and he yeah helicopter Pakistani helicopters don't fly at night around a, a city like Abbottabad so uh Bin Laden knew the game was up it was a moonless night the electricity was off in the neighborhood which is not uncommon in Pakistan because you have these rolling blackouts, known as brownouts. Um, and, you know, his wife wanted to, you know, also was his young youngest wife was with him. She wanted to turn on a light. He basically said no. He, he knew that the Americans arrived as soon as he heard those, and just heard that the sound of the helicopters, even before the helicopter crashed, he knew the game was up. And in the movie, we do see Team Six taking things from the compound after killing Bin Laden. There's books, DVDs, CDs, computer hard drives, but they only have a few minutes to do this because, according to the movie, uh, they can't stay longer because the Pakistanis have scrambled F-16, so they have to get out of there. Can you explain some of the politics that were at play of the U.S. military taking off from Afghanistan to strike a target in Pakistan? What sort of risks, risks were up in the air if it hadn't been Bin Laden? Well, I mean, there was certainly, there was initially some discussion about a joint operation with the Pakistanis that was dismissed because people thought that the, the information would leak. Um, yeah, Pakistan was a normal ally in the war against Al-Qaeda. Uh, relations were pretty bad at this time uh, because the CIA contractor had just killed two Pakistanis. He'd put, been put in jail and been released. So the, the relationship, which was always kind of fraught, was kind of at a low point already. Um, yeah, the concerns of the White House were the Pakistani equivalent of West Point was a, was about a mile from the Bin Laden compound. You know, would there be a Pakistani quick reaction force that sort of came on and exchanged fire, not really knowing who they were firing on? Could Al Qaeda have, you know, a bigger presence than within, or might there be some response from Al Qaeda? Could some of the SEALs be taken captive or by Al Qaeda or captured by the Pakistanis? You know, there was a lot of, yeah, potentially negative things that could happen. And, the F-16s, Pakistan did scramble them. They, they, you know, they didn't, you know, uh, they weren't really clear what was going on. They knew it wasn't their own helicopter that had crashed. Um, and they, um, but Pakistan doesn't have much of a capacity to fly at night. Um, and I think people who really understood Pakistani, so a flying capabilities knew that the, the, even though the F-16s had scrambled, it didn't mean that they were going to be able, be able to find, you know, stealth helicopters in the middle of the night flying into Afghanistan, but certainly they, you know, Admiral McRaven's running the operation, 
he basically had done a long study of these and he'd done many of these and operations is like we you know once you get past half an hour on the ground you've given up the element of surprise which was true in this case he gave another 18 minutes for the seals to gather all this material and at a certain you know once 40 minutes in so like it's time to wrap up they got bin Laden's body on the helicopter they took all this material they blew up the helicopter that had landed uh to take the, the hard landing because it had all this you know very interesting stealth uh, material and avionics. They didn't want that to sort of end up in the wrong hands, and um, and they left. And they, but it's still like a you know, it's still like at least an hour plus to get to the Afghan border, uh, flying uh, and uh, yeah. But they they got there, and everybody was very happy to hear you know, welcome to Afghanistan. Yeah. What did we learn from some of the data that was gathered by SEAL Team Six? We, we learned a lot about how a you know, couple of things, you know, we learned a lot about what Bin Laden was thinking because he never expected this to kind of fall into enemy hands. He, um, there was a Bin Laden family journal. They were very concerned about the Arab Spring because this was, you know, Bin Laden's view, the biggest event in the Middle East in over a century. And, um, and yet Al Qaeda's ideas and personnel were not involved and, uh, he was trying to work out a way to insert himself into the Arab Spring, release a speech. His two highly educated wives with PhDs were kind of helping him think through what to say. So were his two oldest daughters, who are both adults. So we learned a lot about kind of what Bin Laden was worried about. His bodyguards were planning to leave him. He was very concerned about that because they were just linked to the outside world. He, uh, he was also trying to plan something for the 10th anniversary of 9-11, a big statement. Uh, hopefully a big terrorist attack on an American target. You know, he was kind of delusional about Al-Qaeda's capabilities, but he was certainly very much in touch with Al-Qaeda affiliates in Somalia and Yemen, North Africa, et cetera, the Pakistani Taliban, the Afghan Taliban. Uh, he was trying to maintain all these relationships and try to instruct these various groups about what they should be doing. Uh, so, you know, he had a lot of time on his hands. He wrote all of the material. There were 6,000 pages of useful material. Um, and, um, a lot of it is about kind of how he was trying to manage Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda's affiliates. And also some of it is about his personal relationship with his wives, with his kids. Um, and all that is now in the public domain. Wow. Wow. You mentioned this earlier in your book, Manhunt, um, in 2013, there was an HBO documentary based on your book. And in there, you do a great job recounting a lot of the events that lead up to your interview with Bin Laden in 1997. And I want to ask you, in that documentary, you asked the cameraman, uh, another another Peter uh, Juvenal, and you asked him if he remembers what it was like when Bin Laden entered the room, you know, shaking his hand. But the question was never posed to you. So what was your experience like meeting Bin Laden? You know, we were there to do an interview. I mean, and it was, you know, I, I was mostly focused on the mechanics of that. Are we getting the questions in that we need? We had limited time with him. He was maybe you know, somewhere between 60 to 90 minutes. We were not allowed to bring anything with us, including watches. Yeah. Um, they gave us their camera to do the interview because they were very concerned about tracking devices. So, um, yeah, I was mostly focused on like, we need to, get in the questions we want. We need to make sure that this is lit properly. We need to, you know, make maximum use of the time we have with him. Uh, so I was focused on that, you know, um, I wasn't focused on kind of what I was, it, yeah, it, it, I, I knew we, we had a lot of questions and very little time. So I was kind of like making, you know, I mean, I was the producer, so I was responsible for making sure the thing worked. <laughs> <laughs> and it yeah, sounds like you're know, using equipment that you're not used to and so I had to kind of do it all on the fly a lot. Sounds like. Well, we knew that going up there. I mean, they also provided, you know, we were in the middle of the mountains. They provided a generator so that we had you know, uh, light, you know, yep. so, yeah, you know, they, but you know, none of this is not like we could argue with them about well, hey, we brought probably $50,000 of, you know, professional equipment. We had to leave that behind. This was not upfitted, but it was either that or no interview or on their camera. And so we did the interview on their camera and it, you know, it came out, it looked for Peter Juvenal, who's the cameraman. Yeah. 
did a very professional job with uh, a less good camera. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on to chat about Zero Dark Thirty. Um, since the is, fo movie does focus a lot on the U.S. government's search for bin Laden, it doesn't really show much about bin Laden himself. That leads me right into your newest bin Laden book called The Rise and Fall of Osama Bin Laden. It's an incredibly well-done biography. As of today, it is out on paperback. Before I let you go, I have to ask, in the decades since you've been reporting and writing about bin Laden, is there something that you've learned about him in that time that has surprised you? Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing that I thought is, you know, I've been following him since 96. Um, and one thing that, um, that certainly that I, I found interesting was the extent to which he was relying on his older ones to help him edit his speeches, to think through his strategic, you know, reasoning, you know, he, look, he, he, you know, what, what is Bin Laden's ideal end state? It's a Taliban style theocracy. And, you know, so I think, you know, people, anybody who's listening to this might be sort of surprised to the extent to which he really relied on these two highly educated wives. Both of them had PhDs. One was a child psychologist with an independent career before she married Bin Laden. Another one had a PhD in Quranic grammar. They both claimed descent from the Prophet Muhammad. And they came from sort of distinguished families. Um, they both joined Bin Laden they got married to Bin Laden knowing that he was already married. They, 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 uh, they were true believers in his cause. Um, and, you know, one of the wives had been, after 9-11, lived in Iran under some form of house arrest for a decade. She rejoined him in February of 2011, a few months before he was killed. And, you know, he was very excited about seeing her. She was 62 and he was 54 at the time. And he sent her these letters, which were almost like love letters about how excited he was mm. to be seeing her. So, you know, Hitler was nice to his dog. Um, that doesn't mean that he wasn't, you know, responsible for the Holocaust. So Bin Laden, it turns out, was, you know, fairly nice to his immediate family members. Uh, that doesn't mean he wasn't responsible for 9-11. So, but I think that what we, some of the materials of the SEALs found that night, which are portrayed in the film, and, you know, it, we have a really good understanding now of what was happening inside Al-Qaeda in the years after 9-11, what Bin Laden was doing, what he was thinking. Um, and as sort of an historian of all this, uh, that to me is super interesting and you find new things, whether it's Bin Laden's relationship with his, with his older wives and the importance of, of that, or, you know, you reacted to this, that his two bodyguards were planning to leave him. In fact, you know, the relations with the bodyguards got so bad that he wrote them a letter, even though they lived together like yards apart. And in January of 2011, he wrote them a letter saying, Hey, I know that you're we last time we met, it was so angry that I feel like it, I need to put in writing what we agreed to, which is, you know, you'll stay with me for another several months while I find replacements. So he was very cognizant that this was a big problem because these guys spoke Arabic, they spoke the local language, Pashto. They were Pakistanis who grew up in Kuwait, so and they long been members of Al Qaeda. They were not going to be easy people to replace, but they were fed up because they were taking, you know, being paid very little, hundred dollars a month to look after the world's most wanted man. And they were fed up and they wanted to move on. And of course, they were right to be fed up because both of them would be killed in the SEAL raid. It was a very dangerous job. Um, and, you know, Obama turned out to make the right choice because it, it is, if he'd waited longer, you know, it's possible that the bodyguards would have left and Bin Laden would have left because without the bodyguards, Bin Laden couldn't stay in that house. It was registered in that, in that bodyguard's name. Uh, they, you know, they, they would have going to have to separate. So. Uh, one of the things that was discussed you know, that isn't in the film was, you know, one of the deliberations of the White House is it like, you know, if we don't do, doing nothing is also a form of decision making. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, this, what happens if Bin Laden leaks, which, or what happens, you know, if this leaks out, that he's there in some way, because the more people you involve, the more, you know, the, somebody was once asked, how do you keep a secret in Washington? And the answer is don't tell anybody. And, um, you know. <laughs> Once you start planning a military operation, you know, the, the circle of knowledge was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, so there were risks and just doing nothing, which, so President Obama obviously made the right call. Yeah, well, I'm looking at it from hindsight, definitely. Well, I'll make sure to include links to your book in the show notes for this episode. Thank you again so much for your time, Peter. Okay, thank you, Dan. Take care. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. 
I'd like to thank Peter Bergen once again for sharing his knowledge and expertise. And if you want to learn more about the true story, I would highly recommend his excellent biography that's now available on paperback called The Rise and Fall of Osama Bin Laden. I'll make sure to include a link to that as well as a link to the other of Peter's books that we mentioned in this episode called Manhunt. That book focuses on the search for Bin Laden. As always, you can find links to Peter's book in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, one of the American helicopters really did crash during the raid on Bin Laden's compound. Number two, the U.S. found Bin Laden's compound through his courier. Number three, the U.S. government knew with absolute certainty that Bin Laden was inside the compound when President Obama ordered the raid. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. One of the American helicopters really did crash during the raid on Bin Laden's compound. That is true. As we learned from Peter, not only did one of the helicopters crash at the compound during the raid, but even before that, just the sound of helicopters at night tipped off Bin Laden that he had been found and it was over. That brings us to number two. The U.S. found Bin Laden compound through his courier. That is also true. U.S. intelligence tracked down Ibrahim Saeed, who also lived on the compound. That means number three is the lie. The U.S. government knew with absolute certainty that bin Laden was inside the compound when President Obama ordered the raid. As Peter told us, no one really knew for certain that bin Laden was inside the compound. There were some, like the movie suggests, that thought that he was there, while others weren't quite as certain. Actually, as we learned, there was more circumstantial evidence for WMDs, weapons of mass destruction, than for bin Laden being in that compound. Of course, we know from history how the whole WMDs thing went down quite differently than the Bin Laden raid. If you enjoyed this episode, you can help support the next episode and get ad-free versions of the show over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. <laughs>